Hey, white girl. <laughs> hey, white girl. <laughs> hey, white girl. Really? Are we for real? Hola, como estas? El sol está brillando. Anishna <gasps> Bayendo! Hey, it's me. So today, as you can tell from the title, we're going to be talking about a topic that gets brought up and argued over just about every day in Indian country racial identity, and more specifically, how it relates to indigenous identity. <laughs> For some reason, this has been such a difficult topic. Relationships have disintegrated over disagreements about this topic. People have blocked others on social media, been roasted by the masses, and outcast for not understanding, which, in my opinion, the roasting is justified if the roastee has already received education and thus had ample opportunity to grow from it. And people have exhibited colorist behaviors because of this topic, yet we keep circling back to the conversation, and we probably will again. Before we get too far into this video, let's roll through a few disclaimers. We'll of course be talking about mixture with different racial and ethnic identities, but a lot of the points here are going to be about native proximity to blackness and native proximity to whiteness. This is because two common catalysts for this conversation involve a native mixed with white not understanding their proximity to whiteness fully or at all, and a native mixed with black being discriminated against by other natives. And to make things a little easier, in this essay, when I refer to natives, I am referring to those indigenous to North America. And when I refer to indigenous peoples, I am referring to indigenous peoples worldwide. Compared to past video essays, this video will be less essay-like and more laid back. It will be more based on my opinions that I've formed through learning about sociological and psychological theories, and less based on research I've only recently conducted. Therefore, I'll be citing fewer sources, but I will of course link other helpful resources in the description to supplement this video if you're interested. In addition, some of the information presented in this video will overlap with information in my video essay on blood quantum. I highly suggest you check that video out either before this one or after, doesn't matter, but for the sake of clarity, some themes will be repeated in this video, including the definition of race and its evolution, but in a different context. Of course, you're welcome to share your thoughts in the comments section, but please be respectful to others and please, please watch the video first and hear what I have to say. I hope you will have an open mind to what I have to say, as I've learned much of this from having an open mind myself, and my mind remains open to the concerns of others. I do not wish to offend anyone, and I will repeat myself time and time again that I am not saying anyone is less native. So let's go. What is race, and why do natives argue about it so much? This entire video could really be ended right here at the end of the next sentence, but alas, people need topics to be elaborated on. There is no single, worldwide, universal, all-encompassing, everyone-agrees-on-it definition of race. 
The definition of race not only has changed several times throughout history, but it's still changing and will always change as people and societies evolve. Race is also defined differently throughout the world. For example, someone considered white in Central and South America most likely won't be considered white in North America. This is because whiteness is not just a color, it's rather an idea. Whiteness is attributed to the dominant group that holds power over other social groups. And even though someone in Brazil has brown skin, they can still hold power over Brazilian minorities and thus have proximity to their society's definition of whiteness. Though race is different throughout time and place, it is generally understood in two different ways. First, race is understood by heritage, who you're born to, the race of the people you descended from. This understanding is more objective, as in it is based on fact and not on opinion. Second, phenotype, your physical features, but only the physical features that are commonly understood in society as meaningful in determining someone's race. This understanding is more subjective, as in it is less based on fact and more based on opinion. The heritage-based understanding of race is a more simple way to identify someone, but it isn't outwardly obvious to others. One could say, I am descended from a native mother and a native father, therefore I am native. But strangers may or may not be able to identify that they are native without being told. These strangers may perceive you another way, which is why the phenotype understanding is also important. I want to stress that there is nothing inherently wrong with this. People confuse me for other races all the time, and that's okay. It's natural. It is the negative implications attached to purposely misidentifying someone that are problematic. But remember that most of the time, if you're mistaken for another race, people generally aren't being disingenuous. You are who you are, and your heritage is factual regardless of what others' opinions are of you. However, heritage does not alone define race, because race is a socially constructed concept, as in society has subconsciously agreed that race is defined by phenotype, despite it being an unreliable way to determine a person's race, and there being no scientific backing at all. But just because basing race off of looks isn't the correct and accurate way doesn't mean it isn't a social norm, nor does it mean our current thinking towards race doesn't have real effects. Barack Obama is half black and half Irish, but because of how he looks, he's referred to as black. Brian Furcus, who plays the drag character Trixie Mattel, is half Ojibwe and half white, but because of how he looks, he's referred to as white. If you are surprised to learn the background of either of these individuals, then you can get a sense of what I'm saying. You may have already familiarized yourself with this concept if you have been supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. Black people have been racially profiled simply because of how police officers and the general public perceive them, regardless if they're half German or Irish. Among the many ways the concept of race has an impact on individuals, how others view you and interact with you is one of those impacts and is a significant factor in one's day-to-day -day life in relation to their race. Now I understand I may already be confusing some of you if you haven't heard of these things before. I get it. I'm sitting here saying to you, opinion doesn't define your identity, but it does. It sounds contradictory, and that's because it is. Society, as in people in general, are contradictory. People say one thing and then do another. There are joys of society, and there are fouls of society, but the important fact is that society is not perfect. It is, after all, a collection of humans. Because race was created by society, the idea of race is imperfect as well. This, however, does not negate the existence of the social construction. Just because something should be perfect doesn't mean it simply doesn't exist in its imperfect form. 
In other words, we have to come to terms with the reality that things are the way they are. We can work to change things, but this is still our current reality. I think that not coming to terms with our reality is what causes people to not understand their race or race in general. And when we don't understand race, we have massive disagreements, discrimination, and other setbacks, and we can't grow. Ironically, these are the things that define race and categorize people. Disagreements and discrimination are what led to a racial category being formed most of the time. The English and the Irish were once different groups with an oppressor-oppressed relationship, and now in North America, they're pretty much the same. Perhaps before deep diving into what race currently is, we should look at the history of race and how it was created. When we think of the earliest, most well-known accounts of initial contact, such as the English and Wampanoag relations, we think of it as a white versus native thing. That is, however, how we view it through the lens of today, when back then it was the white-skinned Christians of various European nations versus the brown-skinned non-Christians of various tribal nations. I know this sounds silly to some, and that's why I'm really trying to beat in the concept that there wasn't race. The same could be said when Africans were first kidnapped from their tribes. They weren't black or of a different race. They were considered non-Christian, black-skinned prisoners who worked alongside indentured servants, except compared to indentured servants, they were slaves for life, and their children would be too. What we now know as race is rather a political construction that was socially developed later in history because native and European relations deteriorated and the slave trade boomed. It was heavily based on stereotypes and cultural differences, as well as the justification for maltreatment of natives and Africans and political strategy to retain supremacy and power over other races and nations. Before race was this idea, society divided people into categories based on their religion or spirituality and their nation. Europeans further divided people by their social and economic class. Peasants. In terms of power and oppression done by the average European and or European settler, they separated themselves from what they considered non-Christian heathens that were indigenous peoples which includes those indigenous to Africa, but Europeans also separated themselves from other Christian denominations, such as Protestant England having issues with Catholic Ireland. Although race wasn't a thing yet, color was of course a factor as well, as light-skinned Northern Europeans separated themselves from the olive-toned Spaniards, Italians, and other Mediterranean groups. But when worldwide colonization and slave trade grew rampant, not only did having proximity to groups we didn't have proximity to before sort of require society to have to set newish definitions of each other, but people needed to justify their cruelty towards and the exploitation of other groups. This classroom is how the initial ideas of race were born. By assigning people to racial categories, these categories could then assign people to their respective place on the social hierarchy, which had Europeans at the top, of course. This allowed supremacists to maintain order socially and politically and continue to steal land and labor from the Africans and other indigenous groups. There is a long, complex history of how Africans became capital-building property and natives became obstructive of land acquisition. This history is beyond the scope of this video, but I do suggest looking more into it on your own time so you can get a deeper sense on how molehills form into mountains, so they say. As previously mentioned, race is heavily determined by outsiders phenotypically. But in its beginnings, nationality had a powerful impact, especially because there was less mixture back then. But in the context of how race changes and relates to a native identity now, let's look at how whiteness changed in the last 130 years or so. 
In the earlier days of immigration, the Irish and Mediterranean groups, including Italians and Jewish groups, were considered lower on the social hierarchy, somewhat alongside natives, African Americans, and Asian Americans. They were oppressed, discriminated against, and brutalized, and therefore did not have powerful whiteness like Northern Europeans, such as the English and the French did. Throughout time, these groups gained access to whiteness in a few ways. First, each in their own way, they oppressed blacks and natives in the workforce by excluding them from their unions and newly built economies. They participated in the brutalization of blacks and natives in order to steal their capital and gain social acceptance by the dominant group. And because proximity to each other and being away from their homelands led to ethnic and cultural mixture, thus creating what's known as the melting pot, which formed what we now know as the white American. Gone are the days where you can look at a white person and almost always guess their nationality which is why those who are racial minorities can blend into white America if they look a certain way, or they won't blend in. Black Americans, having their ties to their homelands and indigenous cultures severed, built new cultures and societies for themselves. Natives, having faced near genocide as well as near cultural genocide, worked to rebuild cultural and population losses. Mixture has increased for both groups in the last century, particularly for natives, but our place on the social hierarchy has mostly remained the same. While our groups generally don't have access to whiteness, increased mixture has resulted in more members either gaining proximity to whiteness, mostly for those who are mixed with white, or facing multiple forms of discrimination, such as those who are mixed with other minority groups. And this is because... As mentioned before, the determination of race is heavily influenced by phenotypical features deemed important by society. However, not only do these features have no scientific grounding in the context of defining race, but features considered important in race are based on those present in ancestral groups who lived hundreds to thousands of years ago, when humans have since altered our gene pools and increased the complexity of our identities. Despite this, the belief that race is biological continues into today because features that we assign to different races are obvious to us, while we don't think heavily about other features that are based in the same genetics. For example, skin color and eye color. We assign people to white, black, or native based on skin color, but we don't make these assignments based on eye color. Someone who is black with blue eyes is still considered black, despite the fact that both their eyes and their skin are that specific shade due to the produced amount of a chemical called melanin. Countless studies have discredited the theory that race is a real biological thing. In fact, studies found that there are more genetic differences within racial groups than between groups meaning there can be more genetic similarities between a white person and a black person than between two black people. Sounds bonkers, I know, but it's true. And if you subscribe to race science and blood quantum, then this is some cold, hard, factual science for you. But the science of race is really evolution. I'm not talking about the we're all from Africa and we migrated kind of evolution. I'm not touching that conversation. Well, actually, I'll just insert the fact that the Bering Straits theory has several unanswered questions and there's evidence of humans being in the Western Hemisphere long before crossing Beringia was possible. There, that's all you get on that. But what I mean by evolution is genetic sequences are made up of what we get from our parents, right? And what they get from their parents and so on and so forth. People obviously reproduced with people who were in proximity to them. In addition, our genes reacted to the environment we were put in. Over time, these factors resulted in a gene pool where traits sort of get passed around like a hockey puck and become common, but only common as not every single person in the pool receives the trait. 
For example, sharp cheekbones, hooded eyes, and full lips have been common among natives, but again, not everyone has all or any of these traits. An increase of melanin production is found in areas with intense sun and not so much in less sunny areas, which is why blonde hair, blue eyes are found north in Europe, but people's skin, eyes, and hair get darker the closer you travel to the equator. Evolution explains the human body's reaction to its environment and proximity to other humans with certain traits over thousands and thousands of years. But traits are just that. Traits. They do not determine race. We, as people, as a society, determine race. And while race is scientifically fiction, it's still a very real phenomenon that has very real effects on people. And this is why I say that both heritage and the opinions of others determines your race. I'm often perceived by strangers as white and or Hispanic, and this affects me in a way that I have proximity to whiteness and therefore am given privilege. In other words, people see me as white and they treat me as though I'm exclusively white, which gives me a certain amount of power compared to minorities who aren't seen as white. This, however, doesn't change my inherited race as an Ojibwe native. I'm still a member of this distinct group, and I always have been. On the other hand, natives who are mixed with black often, not always, are perceived by strangers as black, and this affects them in a way that their being native is questioned or not believed. In other words, people see them as black and treat them as though they are exclusively black which often results in discrimination and black natives being denied access to their cultures and communities. Again, this doesn't change their inherited race as a native. They are still members of their distinct groups and they always have been. Please remember that although this isn't always the case, as many times I was not accepted into whiteness and black natives were accepted as being native, but this is generally how it goes. And it's mostly because the simple fact that society uses traits to assign people to categories to make the world of information much simpler to them. But it's also because of deeply rooted ideas of what a race should be, despite our social groups and our very phenotypes rapidly evolving. Among the many ways race impacts our lives regardless of what we look like, such as generationally or systemically, Experiencing race interpersonally is still different than the other ways, but it does not negate them. A white native can be born into poverty on a rural res and suffer from all sorts of traumas, but still receive white privilege from others. A black native can be born into a comfortable native home and live a stable life, but still be oppressed by others. Two basic points to remember here is that different systems have different impacts and Anecdotal accounts of discrimination don't negate the larger system of power and oppression. One way I've heard the latter point explained is this. A man goes to an interview at an all-woman business and is told he cannot be hired because he's not a woman. Was he discriminated against? Yes. Is this sexism? No. This one account does not invalidate the entire system that impacts almost all women, nor does it negate the fact that he had privilege over women his entire life leading up to that moment. This same concept applies to all isms that represent power imbalances. And this is why it's such a difficult topic in Indian country. Most of us aren't taught what exactly isms are. Many white natives can't or refuse to acknowledge their privilege, and many black natives have to work twice as hard to gain half the acceptance. And the worst thing is, we're all native. We all claim to love our cultures and to be decolonizing, but then play into colonizer power dynamics, which in reality is so silly because the bottom line is race isn't real. It's made up. It's a concept, a literal fakety fake thing that humans concocted. It's fiction. It's not scientific. Blood quantum and the one drop rule are both bullshit. It's outdated and based on outdated circumstances. 
What is real are the wide range of impacts that are birthed from this fake concept. Black Americans simply have a trait where their skin produces more melanin than other groups, but they're persecuted for it. Native societies were torn to the ground and were still disenfranchised by the oppressors. Treating people based on the way they look and putting systems into place for certain races are very real effects of race, even if it contradicts one's actual heritage. And this is commonly misunderstood by people who either don't want to admit their whiteness or people who don't want to include those with blackness. Like I said, being perceived a certain way isn't inherently wrong. It's fragility or discrimination that become issues. We need to break away from this kind of thinking, as well as blood quantum and one-drop rule practices, and just in general outdated thinking of race. If you would like more information, I strongly suggest watching my video on blood quantum. I will link it at the end of this video and in the description. It contains a lot of extra information that might be helpful, such as more on race science and DNA tests, and how race science affects native nations. Bama Pi Guaman. Hey white girl.